So in the last video, I taught you guys that in order for you to describe a population, you have to look at the phenotype ratios or the ratios of looks, the genotype ratios or the ratios of gene combinations, and the allele frequencies or how many of each type of gene for any given trait or character shows up in the population. So let's actually review these concepts with the example that uh, we're going to do now, which is about the coat color of cows. So. If you are a dominant or have a, any big B values, the cow is going to be black. And if there's two little uh, Bs or recessive values, the cow is going to have the red coat in this example, okay? So if you have, say, 200 cows and 100 of those cows are homozygous dominant, 50 of those cows are heterozygous, and 50 of those cows are homozygous recessive, you are now, you now can use this to calculate the genotype and phenotype frequencies in a population. So the genotype frequencies will, of course, be the total number of that particular genotype divided by the total number of members of the population. In this case, the population is 200 cows and 100 homozygous dominant. So you're going to have 0.5 or 50 percent of the population is going to be homozygous dominant. Another 25 percent of the population is going to be heterozygous since it's 50 out of 200. And the same ratio would be, would be for the homozygous recessive, which it matches the phenotype frequency. Remember that the phenotype frequency for the recessive is always going to match the, the genotype frequency of the homozygous recessive because there's only one way of looking recessive. However, both of these will look dominant because this is an example of complete dominance and therefore the phenotype frequency for black will be a combination of both those genotypes. And if you were given only the phenotype frequency, you would have it would be impossible to differentiate between the two because they're at the at the level of seeing the organism, you can't tell what the genotype is since both of them will look dominant. Okay? Now, in this sort of cows, then now that we have these numbers, we can also calculate the allele frequencies. Remember that the allele numbers are always going to be twice as many as you have the number of the population because each member of the population is diploid and should have two alleles each. So if you have 400 cows, you're going to have 400 alleles in this population. So you can guess then if the first one you have 100 big Bs, that means you're going to count that twice because each one of the each cow that is like that has two big Bs in it. So you're going to cross two times 100 plus the big Bs that show up in the heterozygous once, so 50. That gives you a total of 250 uh, big Bs or dominant alleles in the population. And since the total number is 400, that gives you 0.625 or 62.5% of the population is going to be made up of dominant alleles. And you repeat the same process for the recessive LU, and you count again the number of the genotype twice because that will have two in it, plus half plus once the the uh, heterozygous number. So that gives you a total of 150 uh, recessive values out of the 400 which are in the population. So that's 30.375 or 37.5 percent of the population will ha will be made up of the recessive LU. Now. There, remember, there is a shortcut that we talked about at the end of the last video to get to this allele frequency if you already know the genotype frequency. Remember, there's a way to go from here to that. And again, the shortcut is basically cons getting for the dominant allele the total frequency of the homozygous dominant plus half of the frequency of the heterozygous. And for the homozygous recessive, or for the recessive allele, you get the total frequency of the homozygous recessive plus half the frequency of the heterozygous. So in this case, you would get, um, for the homozygous dominant, is 0.55, the homozygous recessive was 0.25, and so was the heterozygous look. So you put all of this together, you will see that to get the frequency of the dominant LU, you're going to get all of that, so 0.5, plus half of that, which was 0.25, and that will give you uh, 1.12. 25, I believe, and when you add that to the 0.5, you get the 6.625, which is the same number we got up there, right? So you see there's a shortcut there. And you can repeat the same process for the for the homozygous recessive, um, and for, to get the recessive value, you get all of the homozygous recessive ratio plus half of the heterozygous ratio to actually add it together, and you still get 0.375, which is the same number we got up there. So whichever way you're going to do it, that's how you calculate genotype frequencies, phenotype frequencies, and allele frequencies in the, com in the com population to actually describe the composition of the population. The cool thing about this is that once you know how to work with the allele and, and 
frequencies and genotype and, and phenotype frequencies, you can actually use this knowledge of population genetics to make predictions about what happens in a future generation based on the numbers of the previous generation. So to review uh, Mendel's crosses, when you get something that's homozygous recessive and you cross with someone just like it, you're always going to get homozygous recessive children because that's what we call a true breeding recessive cross. The same thing is true about the true breeding dominant cross and you're always going to get the dominant children. But if you get these two of the true breeding cross and you do different kinds of true and you cross them together, you do what it's called the parental cross, where we're crossing the parents or the parental generation. And of course, all the children will be heterozygous, and you get a big A, little a, and that's what Mendel called the F1 cross. Now, if you cross that, you pretty much get what looks like here. That's the F1 cross. When you get the two heterozygous and cross together, you get a 1 to 1 ratio of, of, of genotypes in the population, and that's the F1 cross that gives you the F2 generation that has that genotype ratio. Now, Interestingly enough, if you already know the LU frequencies of a certain population, for example, in this example, I'm giving you that the big A LU or the dominant LU is 80% of the population. So I'm giving you that frequency. And I'll also tell you, of course, that the rest is going to be the homozygous recessive. They always have to add up to one. That's something I forgot to mention. You can always check your work because the LU frequencies always add up to ones, and the genotype frequencies and the phenotype frequencies all add up to one because everything you have added together has to be 100% of what's out there. So that means then in this particular example, we have an 80 to 20% distribution of the LUs. Now, if I want to find out what will happen in the next generation after all these children kind of have sex with each other and, and they, when they get mature enough to do so, that you will see that what will be the chances of a particular genotype or phenotype in that particular population. Now. The way you do this is that you do a Punnett square that looks like the one we did. You get the values and you cross them against each other and in what it would call an F1 cross. So if you want to find out the probability of a certain generation creating another new generation, you always do the values in an F1 cross like this. So you get the 0.8 time and 0.2 and you split them and do segregation and you do that twice on both sides, right? And then, of course, you're going to get one-to-one -one genotypes. So you're going to get, and you, that way, you're going to calculate the chances of that genotype showing up, the chances of that genotype showing up, and the chances of this genotype showing up. And notice, of course, there's going to be one box for the homozygous dominant. There's going to be one box for the homozygous recessive, and there will be two boxes for the heterozygous, right? Uh, and remember, this is just a, a way to, to do the math to calculate the chances of a certain genotype frequency or, or, or alu frequency or even the chances of a phenotype frequency on the next generation based on what you know from the previous generation. You always set it up as an F1 cross and put the alu segregated and you multiply the odds. Now, you don't look just at the genotypes, you're also going to multiply the, the alu ratios to get the chances of that genotype showing up. It's because you got parents which are independently going to either give or not give that alu. So you're going to be independent chances of both of those things happening. So you multiply the odds. And so you're going to get 0.8 times 0.8 on this box, a green box. And you see that that's going to give you the 0.64 that you see over here for the homozygous dominant genotype frequency or 64 percent of the population will be like that now for the homozygous recessive it will be 0.2 times 0.2 because that's the ratio of that alu and if, if you do the math you find out this 0.4 it's, that's the only box so four percent of the population will have that genotype and then you see that the other box will be um, multiplication of 0.8 times 0.2 which is 0.16 but there's two of those boxes, so the total will be 0.32. You gotta count it twice. That tells you then the genotype frequencies of the population are gonna be 64% homozygous dominant, 32% heterozygous, and 4% homozygous recessive. Now, of course, if you wanna calculate the phenotype frequencies, you're gonna add the two that will make you look dominant together, and you get something like this 0.64 plus 0.32, which is a 96% of the population, will look like that. And, but remember that the genotype frequency of the homozygous recessive matches the frequency for the recessive look. So 4% of the population will look recessive. And that is, of course, adding up to 100%. So we did this right. So you see, 
that based on the alley frequency of the parental generation, you can figure out the frequencies that are going to be present in the offspring of both the genotype and the phenotype. And you can also calculate the alley frequencies to see what you would get. And of course, we can use that rule about counting this, the homozygous, once and then counting the heterozygous half to get the, the, that alley frequency. Now, notice that if you get the ratio here was 0.64 plus half of this 0.32, which is 0.16, you would get 0.8, which is the same thing you had in the parents. That's interesting. And if the big A is 0.8, that means that the big little A is going to be 0.2. And you, you indeed get that because half of 0.32 is 0.16 plus all of the homozygous recessive is 0 0.4, 0 0.04, sorry. You're going to get 0.2. So notice that the alley frequencies will not change from the previous generation to the next generation because all you did is sex reproduction. This is an important concept because sex reproduction does not change the population. It only shuffles the genes around to create new uh, variation or new looks or new combinations of those already there. But the ratio of alleles stays the same. You still have the same number of big A's and the same number of little A's. You don't add any new little A's or any new big A's to the population. You only cause a reshuffling of that into new kinds of genotypes and phenotypes. So each generation might be different from the previous one because of the combination, but it's not going to be evolution. There's no new mutations or no new selection causing a change in the actual frequencies as observed in a population. And that's an important concept. Sex reproduction does not cause new variation and only causes a recombination of what was already in place. The alley frequencies stay the same, and by definition, that means the population is not evolving.